On this Wednesday night, a tale of international intrigue in Ukraine ends with a stunning twist. An anti-Putin journalist is reportedly shot dead, but that's just fake news. All part of a sting operation aimed at proving a deadly Kremlin plot. Hoax or not, we'll look at the serious problem that lies beneath. Also tonight, the federal government begins its pipeline sales pitch in the oil patch. And we're following the fallout from Roseanne's racist tweet. The U.S. president weighed in and talked about himself. We'll take a deeper look at the cultural impact. This is The National. If you read this plot line in a Cold War thriller, you'd probably shake your head and say it's too far-fetched. Well, you'd be wrong. A Russian journalist who was declared dead yesterday after reportedly being gunned down stunned reporters when he turned up today alive at a news conference in Ukraine. <laughs> Arkady Babchenko told journalists he worked with Ukrainian authorities to fake his death to foil a very real assassination plot against him. The CBC's Chris Brown has the details from Moscow. With police officers and horrified neighbors telling how fierce Putin critic Arkady Babchenko was shot three times in the back, it appeared to be a grisly crime scene at his home in Kiev last night. The world's media covered his death as a big story as friends and admirers held memorials. We visited one on a bridge next to the Kremlin, just as Ukrainian police were calling their news conference and performing their big reveal. Babchenko very much alive. I'm sorry, he said, there was no other way to do this, before apologizing to his stricken wife, who he says really did think he was dead. Apparently, authorities learned two months ago about an assassination plot, so Babchenko agreed to fake his death to help gather evidence. We were in constant contact. We thought things through and worked out the details, he said. Authorities claim a Ukrainian man paid $40,000 to an undercover agent to arrange the hit. This video purportedly shows the money being exchanged. Police arrested the unnamed man. They say the evidence shows the Russian government was behind it all. In the newsroom where Babchenko worked, friends erupted in cheers when he reappeared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ilya Ponomarev was thrilled too. A former Duma member and Putin critic, he says it's the first time Russia has been caught red-handed like this. We are witnessing a unique and very important success of uh, Ukrainian security forces. Uh, Ukrainians managed to document the whole chain uh, with all the communications uh, with uh, uh, how it was procured, uh, with whom was talking to whom, uh, and how the money has been transferred. Russian state TV, though, seemed more amused than alarmed by the whole episode, calling the scheme idiotic, more like a bad Ukrainian TV miniseries than something to be taken seriously. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. So where did Ukraine get this idea to fake a death? Apparently, the country's secret service has done it before. In 2016, Ukrainian authorities arrested a suspect who was planning a bombing. So they used the stage murder of a local city councillor to help flush him out. That same year, they also staged the murder of a human rights lawyer in order to arrest his would-be assassin. And earlier this year, authorities say they caught this man's heart attack on video, but it was just part of a plot to catch his mother-in-law who was allegedly trying to have him killed. Ukrainian authorities may be okay with this as a tactic, but those who fight to keep journalists like Babchenko safe understandably have some mixed feelings. This can be a dangerous profession. Dozens of journalists have already been killed this year, and it's not even June. Reporters Without Borders was interesting in its response today. Firstly, expressing profound relief he is alive, but then condemning the stunt, saying there can be no grounds for faking a journalist's death. This anger isn't surprising, given how many journalists have died in that region alone. At least 70 in the past 25 years, 12 in Ukraine and 58 in Russia. Many of them were murdered and their cases remain unsolved. Here's a look at what else we're working on tonight. In the wake of the Roseanne cancellation, some surprising reactions tonight. What does it all say about America?
And a little later, house calls are making a comeback in parts of Canada. Only this time, paramedics are doing the rounds. First, though, the finance minister took his pipeline plan straight into the heart of oil country. I'll say okay, also... This project will never be built. It is unacceptable in the face of climate change. This isn't exactly the welcome Bill Morneau was hoping for, as he tries to reassure Alberta that the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion will get built. This just one day after announcing the federal government will spend billions of taxpayer dollars to buy the project that has been under siege from the very start. Now, there's plenty of criticism to go around, but as Katie Simpson explains, the Trudeau government is working hard to sell the idea, knowing full well there may be more at stake than just the pipeline. The finance minister arrived in Alberta with a blunt admission for Canada's business leaders. We did not think that the first best alternative for us was for the federal government to step forward and to need to purchase this project. That was clearly not our first best alternative. As Bill Morneau tries to assure Western oil producers that Ottawa's purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline is the best path forward, there's a new push for his government to offer similar support elsewhere. Will the Prime Minister promise to enter into negotiations to provide the same level of certainty for Energy East? TransCanada killed its plans to build that pipeline last year, in part because of regulatory hurdles. It would have taken oil to ports in Quebec and New Brunswick. One Liberal MP thinks it's an idea worth exploring. I'm simply asking if there's a way that we can get the parties together to see if there's an opportunity to move forward. The Prime Minister appeared to have no interest in the Conservative suggestion. They're pivoting to try and talk about old news uh, and other issues. The Liberals instead will focus on building public support for the pipeline it plans to purchase, a difficult task for MPs from British Columbia. I'm going to keep doing my very best to voice the concerns of constituents as clearly and as honestly and as effectively as I can, and repeatedly as well. But it is Justin Trudeau who has the most on the line. This could be a career-defining decision. It's not just a political legacy thing. It's, a, it's important for the country. Does this work? Is this going to work? Is it going to get built? It could be really good. It could be challenging. This is a big gamble for Trudeau. The fate of his government may rest on how he manages this $4.5 billion project. If there are delays, cost overruns, or if Ottawa can't find a buyer, the consequences could be significant. But if he manages the political and financial risks well, the Liberals could see new levels of support. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. And one thing to watch out for tomorrow, the finance minister heads west from Calgary to British Columbia, where the project is deeply divisive and where the provincial government is fiercely opposed to it. Bill Morneau is chairing meetings of G7 finance ministers and central bankers in Whistler. On to another story about political divisions, though the issues couldn't be more different. In the days since ABC cancelled the hit sitcom Roseanne over a racist tweet sent out by his erratic star, the U.S. culture war has escalated at high speed. Valerie Jarrett, the former Obama advisor targeted by Barr, says she wants this to be a teachable moment. So what can be learned from this clash of political tribes? I'm on my way, and I mean business. It's not clear what Barr has learned. Her latest tweets range from repentant to defiant. Don't feel sorry for me, guys. I just want to apologize to hundreds of people and wonderful writers, all liberal, and talented actors who lost their jobs on my show due to my stupid tweet, adding, I'll be on Joe Rogan's podcast Friday. She seemed to blame the sedative Ambien, which has gained a reputation for alarming side effects. Guys, I did something unforgivable, so do not defend me. It was 2 in the morning, and I was Ambien tweeting. The drug maker responded, racism is not a known side effect. No one is defending her comments. They're inappropriate, but that's what the point that he was making. Donald Trump accused ABC of a double standard, tweeting, Bob Iger of ABC called Valerie Jarrett to let her know that ABC doesn't tolerate comments like those made by Roseanne Barr. Gee, he never called President Donald J. Trump to apologize for the horrible statements made and said about me on ABC. And where was the apology from Bob Iger for ESPN hiring Keith Olbermann after his numerous expletive-laced tweets attacking the president as a Nazi? Others tweeted anger over the loss of a show that spoke to Trump's America. 
The 30 plus million viewers who watched Roseanne should boycott the network, wrote one commentator, who seemed to equate Barr comparing a woman of color to an ape with Jimmy Kimmel mocking Melania Trump's accent. Amid the online firestorm, a compelling observation from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the basketball legend turned culture critic. Ironically, Roseanne is one of the most liberal shows on TV with a clear agenda of tolerance and compassion, he wrote. Indeed, it has depicted the Connors grappling with their transgender grandchild or seeing past their own racist impulse towards Muslim neighbors. Jabbar wrote, Roseanne's tweets may give solace to other racists, but they have no real impact in changing minds. The show, which reaches millions, can affect people by showing tolerance and compassion on a weekly basis. Well, let's get a U.S. perspective on all that's happened in the last 36 or so hours on this story. And Washington Post columnist Alexandra Petri has been writing about it. And, and what do you think all of this says about uh, the state of, of, of politics and debate in the United States? Well, I think this is a classic case of, uh, you know, the... TV show Arrested Development, where there's this bag in the fridge. Michael goes to the fridge and he takes out a bag and it says, Dead dove, do not eat. And he opens the bag and there's a dead dove in it. And he says, you know, what, what did I expect? And I think that's exactly what we're seeing with Roseanne. As long as she's been on Twitter, these have been the kind of things she's been saying. And AB, the fact that ABC was willing to put her show on the air and to sort of take that chance, now they're getting something which really should come as no surprise. So I guess it's it's just sort of another Trump-era moment of someone told you who they were. You should have believed them. But I guess, you know, she came close to a line before but didn't quite cross it. This time she crossed it. ABC acted quickly, even though it's going to cost them, I guess, uh, financially, at least in the short term. Uh, do you commend them for that? Uh, do you think, uh, were you surprised by their what they did? Well, I, I'm always surprised when someone takes a principled stand and... Uh, does anything. So that's always a p positive good. But I do think it wasn't as though she hadn't crossed this line before. The kind of thing she's been tweeting, she tweeted something analogous about Susan Rice, the same sort of comparison, and like fraught with the same deep racism. And so to say that this is this new territory she hasn't been in before, the only thing that's changed is that now she's in a position where people can hold her responsible for what she's saying. She's not just sort of drifting through the ether. And so if those statements didn't respond, represent ABC's values before, they should have known instead of making jokes about it a couple of weeks ago at the upfronts. Few things have surprised me in this. Uh, comments from people like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, which we heard just a while ago, but also uh, from Bill O'Reilly, the former Fox uh, primetime host, uh, an icon of, of, of the right in the United States. And, and he said Roseanne Barr's vicious personal attack on former Obama's senior advisor, Valerie Jarrett, came out of nowhere and cost uh, Ms. Barr and the entire staff of her program their jobs. No surprise yet. But then there's this. ABC and Disney could not continue with the show without insulting millions of Americans. Hey, here's a guy who, uh, you know, rails against political correctness, and, and he seems to be supporting ABC here. Yeah, well, I think there's a difference between political correctness and not being racist, and sort of, this is just obvious racism, and the, the fact that a lot of news outlets were initially saying, oh, controversial remarks, no, this is, if you can't call this racist, you really can't, I'm sort of at a loss for you. So I'm glad that Bill O'Reilly and I are in concurrence on whether or not this is a tolerable thing to say. Literally 15 seconds left. Are we going to be poorer for not having this show on American television? No, <laughs> but I think there's room for a show that could fill this position that's different. Alexandra Petri, thank you very much for speaking with us. From a popular actor's tweets to a basketball executive accused of using Twitter to embarrass and criticize his own players and colleagues. Brian Colangelo, once Toronto's general manager, is now the GM of the Philadelphia 76ers. And now there are allegations that he used Twitter accounts under pseudonyms to send out critical comments. MB drives, gets past Horford. Oh, he stuffs it on him! They are out of the playoffs now, but the consensus is the Sixers did well this year, though few credited Brian Colangelo for that progress. Now the pop culture website The Ringer alleges Colangelo used anonymous Twitter accounts to lash out at his critics while potentially revealing private information. It started with a tip saying Colangelo had five Twitter accounts, 
One was silent, but the others often loud and combative, criticizing the last Philly GM, going after current Toronto GM, Asai Ujiri, and even suggesting a player failed a physical. The implication of the information that's anonymously put out through these accounts um, makes specific reference to players, to trades, to health and privacy issues. So how did all of this come to light? The Ringer did more digging on the tip, then came forward to the Sixers about two of the accounts. But within hours, the other three accounts went private, and that raised suspicion. Colangelo acknowledges using only one account, the silent one that didn't tweet. The Sixers now investigating, but as this sports and entertainment lawyer told CBC Toronto, the damage is all about trust. If, it, if it's seen as though the general manager is providing information that could be detrimental to the team and the players and in his general... Own players and his own be, organization. Yeah, it really speaks to issues of integrity. Still ahead tonight on The National. Paramedics are often rushing patients to the hospital, but a new program has them trying to stop that trip from happening at all. Why house calls are making a comeback. And as Canada inches closer to legalizing marijuana, we'll take you inside three pot companies for a look at the opportunities and challenges ahead. And she's always played with the boys until now. You'll meet the only Canadian teenager invited by Major League Baseball to play with the best girls in North America. Girls in baseball is kind of a really new thing. And people are just kind of adjusting to the idea that maybe sometime a girl could make it to the show. I want to get as far as I can so I can like, keep kind of paving the way for other girls. Tonight on The National, a passenger train has derailed in northern Ontario. The operator, Ontario Northland, says there have been minor injuries. A Twitter user posted these pictures of the scene about 40 kilometers south of the town of Moosonee. The company says it is in the process of arranging transportation for passengers. Some good news tonight for the northern Manitoba community of Churchill. There's a tentative deal to finally fix the only rail line connecting their town to the south. It was heavily damaged by flooding. Two Manitoba groups have teamed up with Toronto-based investment company Fairfax to buy the line, plus the port of Churchill, from U.S. company Omnitrax. Still a number of details to work out, though, before the sale is finalized. And CP Rail operators will be back on the job tomorrow. The 3,000 workers walked off the job late last night, but by this afternoon, there was a tentative deal. It's a fine example of uh, the collective bargaining process working, and uh, in this case, uh, both sides coming together, finding a common ground, and realizing that uh, it's important to get on with it, and we commend them both. The news came as a relief to Canadian farmers and manufacturers who move so much by rail. The engineers and conductors had said fatigue was the main issue in the dispute, but we're not expecting to get details of the agreement until it's ratified. As Canada's population gets older and more seniors call 911 for help, the health care system will have to find a way to keep up with demand. But a special kind of paramedic could help fill that gap. As Christine Birak explains, they're making house calls. We're used to seeing paramedics in action, rushing from one emergency to another. So we're just going to check your blood pressure and make sure everything looks okay, eh? But here in Hamilton, Ontario, they're also doing something different that doesn't require an ambulance. Morning, Muriel. Good morning. How are you, darling? Joe Cox is a community paramedic. He and others go into buildings for low-income seniors, invite residents to come in for a weekly visit, have their risk of falling assessed, check their blood sugar and blood pressure. You're a little bit high. It's like a lie detector. Well, this guy's making you nervous. A study published this week in the Canadian Medical Association Journal found those community paramedics have reduced the number of 911 calls from four calls per 100 apartments a month to just over three. And we think that why that's happened is because we're actually targeting the population before they get to make the 911 call. The study's author says while the health information can be passed along to family doctors, not everyone was on board with the program. I think at first doctors weren't sure about this. Not sure because it's expanding the traditional role of a paramedic. But others say the system needs innovative approaches to cope with an aging population and overcrowded emergency rooms. I think we should worry less about 
about creating turf and silos, saying only this type of provider can do this, only physicians can do this, only nurses can do this. They're saying, who, what are the skills and knowledge we have that can safely deliver care, and how do we work as a team? These would be the same as in the ambulance, just laid out differently. Nova Scotia is also innovating senior care with specialized paramedics. They're responding to 911 calls and navigating each health crisis with backup from nurses and doctors if needed. As it turns out, about 70% of the time that extended care paramedic actually treats the patient on scene, doesn't transport them to the emergency department and actually keeps the senior comfortable and safe at home. The fear is always something may be missed if a patient doesn't go to the hospital. But this ER doctor insists prioritizing patients is key to the entire system. There's a lot of demand on our emergency room. Uh, people, our frontline teams work very hard in the emergency room. And to be able to triage what comes in more effectively is a benefit to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Researchers also found community paramedics provided another benefit. Seniors said this chat improved their quality of life because it made them feel less lonely. All right, young lady. Okay. So I'll see you. Thank you for participating. So uh, I'll see you in two weeks. Christine mm -hmm. Birak, CBC News, here. Hamilton, Ontario. Oh, yes. There is another potential benefit to all this. Consider that when a patient calls 911, an operator may have to dispatch a paramedic who then travels to the patient to do an assessment. That patient may be taken to hospital in an ambulance to get assessed again by a doctor or a nurse. And all that costs the healthcare system. In fact, the study's author says the average Ontario 911 call costs about $1,600. And we have a lot more ahead for you tonight. He calls himself a martyr in the name of recycling. To others, he's at the heart of a counterfeit operation. And now he's heading to prison. First, though, from producing poinsettias to producing pot, how Canadians are getting into the cannabis business. We're either going to make oil out of this or we're going to use the bud and use it and sell it as uh, a smokable product. So this is the gold right here. This is the gold right here. We've been working really closely with the provinces and territories, acknowledging their jurisdiction, that jurisdiction, respect their jurisdiction. Within their jurisdiction, provincial jurisdictions and, and territorial jurisdictions, and I very much respect and acknowledge you know, First Nation jurisdiction. Thank you. That is Bill Blair, the Prime Minister's point man on Bill C-45 to legalize marijuana, working hard earlier this week to make sure local and provincial jurisdictions know that Ottawa hears their concerns. By the end of Monday's Senate committee meeting, while well, dozens of amendments had been added, including one that would even allow provinces and territories to ban people growing their own pot. Even though letting individuals grow up to five plants was a key goal of the original bill. And there could be even more amendments to come, which would push back the legalization date even further, likely to the fall at least. And that won't be welcome news to those banking on a legalized industry. Earlier this year, our Susan Ormiston met some Canadians who took the financial risk and wagered on weed. Tonight, we bring you their stories again. So we've been in the greenhouse business since 1953. My dad started it. I was never worried Meet about... Meet Cole Cacciavelli. His dad, an Italian immigrant, used to grow flowers here wholesale for large grocery chains. So if you went and bought a poinsettia in Toronto, there'd be a good chance it was from here. Four years ago, the son, Cole, and a partner took a calculated risk to get into cannabis. Okay, so were you a former doper, Cole? <coughs> no, not at all. Both? No, not at all. And uh, when I first when I first got my hands on one of the plants, I always thought you smoked the leaves when we were in high school. I, I had no idea. He's got a much better idea now because there are no more flowers. Growing weed is all they do. Yeah. What's your goal? Uh, a little over 100,000, about 110. 100,000 kilos? 100, about 110, actually. His company in Leamington, southwestern Ontario, is in the middle of a grand expansion, growing the greenhouse space by 10 times to a million square feet of pot. What you see here is 700,000 square feet. There's another 200,000 square feet tucked away in behind that corner. And why are you doing this? This is a big investment. This is a huge investment, but uh, we're preparing ourselves for what we hope is going to be the recreational market come July. What you hope is going to be the recreational market? Yeah. 
So we're pretty confident that it's coming and we want to be ready. So banish the image of potheads dragging on doobies. This is what going legal looks like. Afria's slogan, we have a good thing growing. So pretty clinical in here. Oh yeah. Thanks. Yeah. For contamination, is that what you're... Absolutely. It just doesn't feel like a dope den, you know? Well, you gotta wear that right inside. Oh, I do? Yeah. In fact, we even have to wear hair nets is just one more clue that everything about pot or cannabis is changing. Wow. Yeah, so again, welcome to the dark side. Nearly 60,000 square feet in this one greenhouse. That's some grow up. Cole sees pot profit, not in the long green leaves we so frequently see in pictures, but here in the bud. We're either going to make oil out of this or we're going to use the bud and use it and sell it as uh, a smokable product. So this is the gold right here. This is the gold right here. And you talked about a haze. If you look at that, you can see a white haze there. They're called trichomes and that's actually where the medicine is, the CBDs and the THCs. They're actually in that white haze. I think I have to smoke it before I see the haze. <laughs> you certainly see the haze if you smoked it. So far, Cole's business has been strictly for legal medicinal cannabis. Afria just got a deal to supply shoppers drug mart subject to Health Canada approval. You said your dad uses it now. Uh, absolutely. For he what? He uses it for his arthritis. He calls it his lubrification. <laughs> and he's quite proud to show you how he can move his hands. Was it a tough sell to tell your dad you're switching from poinsettias to marijuana? Uh, not really. Um, again, we strip away that stigma. But you can't strip away the stigma. Canadians are wondering how this is all going to roll out and whether more people are going to use more dope to get high. That's the fear. But we have to strip it away. We have to get beyond that because I can tell you it's much different now today. The money is starting to flow into uh, the science behind what's in this plant. <laughs> Cannabis is not a wild weed anymore. Pharma's pouring money into it, and Canadian businesses are staking their claim. There's increasing value in these buds. Even more in potent and profitable cannabis oil. Those poinsettias that Cole used to grow, they didn't need to be locked up, but that's three. where the bud goes to dry Absolutely. in company vaults. And they're building more. In these level nine vaults, we can store up to $32 million worth of product in the level $32 nine vault. million dollars worth of cannabis can rest in here. Absolutely. So right now we have six vaults and we're building six more. Beats chrysanthemums if you ask me. <laughs> it, could, it could maybe. <laughs> For so long, pot was hidden away, a secret pleasure. Places like this, smoky cafes where you could enjoy your weed while thwarting authorities. They're still going, fueled by a black market in cannabis that's estimated at more than $6 billion. Toronto's Hotbox Cafe doesn't sell weed, but people come here to smoke or vape, part of the conventional pot culture that is about to change dramatically. Abby Roach, the owner here, has been operating for decades on the fringes of a legal business. Now she'll have to adapt and she wants a piece of the business opportunity too. Under the current proposed law, mm -hmm. you won't be able to operate. No. After how many years here? Uh, I've been open for almost 20 years. Currently, we're not technically allowed to operate now as well, but we do and we serve a public purpose. Uh, yeah. To me, if you don't include the people who are already in the industry and you choose to alienate them and push them out, then the, the whole the whole point of legalization fails. It's just the beginning of everything. It Clint is Young sells yeah. medical cannabis yeah. in dispensaries, yeah. which yeah. aren't yeah. actually yeah. legal in Ontario. In the new world, he wants them to be. 
You know, I expected the government to monopolize a side of the market, and rightfully so. They, they've done that. Really? Through. Rightfully so? Well, I mean, you've been doing it as a business for quite some time. Now they're yeah. going to take your business. Well, they, they, I don't think they're going to take my business. The licensed producers who are legally allowed to grow and sell will have to catch up to what's happening in the underground, right? The underground has bubbled for so long and is so creative that they need to catch And massive. It's massive. And massive. And, uh, and they need to catch up. I think the fear's got to stop. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, once all of this kind of settles in the dust, I, I, I hope for a, a fair market. And I, I don't think it's going to be that it, it's appearing right now. It's not a coffee shop only, so what do you call it? Well, it was a coffee shop, now it's a lifestyle store, and it's a cannabis lifestyle store. Hmm. This is it? Oh, these are cute, these little things. Yeah, they're great, right? So that's a, a great example of a well-crafted product, right? Something that you could have in your home and be proud of. But also Welcome to the slick new branding of the, the cannabis lifestyle. It's $335. $335. Yeah, well, Our vase doubles as a bong. Toronto, but it's a necklace. Beautiful, uh, stylish, pipe, high-end products for the consumer, there. like a vape. Put your herb inside of the cartridge, press a button to turn it on. Alan Gertner quit Google to co-found Tokyo Smoke, with six stores across Canada expanding to 10 this year. And it could sit in your home and look like something something normal, special, beautiful. Why does this word normal keep coming up? Are you, why are you trying to normalize a street drug? What, well, like, I think it's already that? normal. And it's, and it's not a street drug, right? I mean, cannabis is heavily consumed in Canada. It is a medicine. It is proven to be a valuable medicine. And with legalization, cannabis is going to sit alongside the other psychoactives that are in our lives, coffee, alcohol, and numerous others. It's not the same as coffee. Why not? Tell me why it's not the same. Tokyo Smoke is on the leading edge, part of a cultural revolution of weed, from the days of reefer madness to now, cool cannabis. These stores can't sell pot in Ontario anyway, but under new laws, might be able to in other provinces. I, you know, understand as Canadians, we might not all align, but this is an opportunity, I think, for us to take a leading position in something that is going to happen anyways. I'm going to challenge you on the going to happen, okay. because part of the going to happen is entrepreneurs like you saying we're going to make the product so appealing that you're going to no, use it uh, and buy it Consumption is more. already high. I, I don't agree. Consumption is already high. So if you uh, take uh, the government at their word, a huge part of legalization of cannabis is harm reduction. We are already using it. So this is more feminine, these products here. Alan and his father have raised more than $10 million from investors in 10 months, and they've partnered with Afria, remember the grower, to brand their own Tokyo Smoke Pot, four different kinds. So this is what our package of cannabis looks like uh, today. Now, obviously, there's not cannabis in here. In here right now is just tea, uh, but you can see how we're trying to develop thoughtful packaging and thoughtful products in the marketplace. It's like a tea box yeah. with cannabis. Well, this right now has tea in it, so it is a tea box. There's a potential huge market here for you. Right. Tokyo Smoke Cannabis for sale, whether you can sell it here or not. That's what we hope. Consumers opt into branded experiences. You go to Starbucks, so people don't know where the coffee beans come from at Starbucks, but you buy Starbucks, you buy into a brand, into experience. Pots power is about to be unleashed, but in the heady rush towards green gold and the cannabis lifestyle, is Canada red? Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto. And since we first brought you that story back in January, the industry has been on a bit of a roller coaster. The cannabis stock index, and yes, there is such a thing, has plunged. It's down over 567 points since its January high, though there are signs of stabilization as some of the bigger fish are swallowing up the smaller ones. Earlier this month, Aurora Cannabis Inc. announced it would buy its competitor, Med Relief, in a whopping all-stock deal worth $3.2 billion. And if all goes according to plan, it will form the largest cannabis company in Canada. 
Well, he is in the business of recycling e-waste, but that business is landing a California man in federal prison. Why he sees this case very differently than authorities do, next on The National. I fought this battle as long and as hard as I could, but I'm fighting a giant, and um, I, I just, there's no winning when you go up against Microsoft. As we head to break, we want to tell you about 15-year-old Tilly Burlock. She's only ever played baseball with boys because there just aren't that many girls' teams to play for. But this week, the Toronto teen is heading to Florida to take part in the first ever development camp for girls hosted by Major League Baseball. And she is the only Canadian to be invited. It's awesome that MLB is doing that. There's so many girls who I know want to play baseball and just don't think it's an option for them. It's a male-dominated sport. I've kind of played sports with boys my whole life, so it hasn't really become a big deal for me. Keep that good D going. When I've played hockey, I always played on a boys' team, um, and I still do, and same with baseball. I definitely think that Major League Baseball doing this is basically saying that they support women playing baseball and that they'd be open to women either playing the MLB or maybe trying to help start a women's major league. It's very exciting. It's, just, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity. I'm, I'm really excited for it. It's really exciting to be able to go down to Florida and play baseball with so many other amazing coaches who are going to be there and just to help me get better as a player and to compete against the other girls who are there and with them. That'll be really fun too. Girls in baseball is kind of a really new thing and people are just kind of adjusting to the idea that maybe sometime a girl could make it to the show. I don't necessarily think that's going to be me, but I want to get as far as I can so I can like, keep kind of paving the way for other girls in baseball so that eventually someone can make it all the way. This is Eric Lundgren. He's 33 years old, an entrepreneur of sorts, and he's heading to prison for importing counterfeit software. Not a particularly salacious crime, but if you think this story is going to simply be about licenses and copyrights and theft, think again. It's anything but straightforward. You see, Lundgren doesn't see his case as being just about counterfeit software. He claims it's much bigger than that. But ask federal authorities, and they'll tell you point blank. He crossed the line. Kim Brunhuber takes us through it. An infinite number of boxes on an infinite number of shelves. Inside them, what looks like bits and pieces of every discarded computer that's ever been built. So, for example... Every year, Let's Eric see, Lundgren yeah. buys 19 million kilograms of old electronics. Computer electronics here. These are servers over here. You have some television sets that are going to be dismantled. They're sent to this giant warehouse 40 kilometers northwest of Los Angeles to be disassembled and eventually reborn. Every single part and piece we're going to save. He's a recycling evangelist. Why are we throwing these away? They're all reusable. And in his own words, he's also an e-waste martyr. In a couple of days, he's going to prison. I fought this battle as long and as hard as I could, but I'm fighting a giant. And um, I just, there's no winning when you go up against Microsoft. We're just gonna dump out. This is what and here's what the battle's about, so-called like. restore disks. When you buy a computer, it usually comes with this software to restore your Windows operating system to its original state. These are the things that you can get for free. I mean, you could download these. You can make them yourself at home. The disks can only be used on a computer that already has a valid Windows license. Lundgren bought these particular restore disks for less than five cents each. I've recycled millions of restore CDs because they're worthless. About six years ago, Lundgren made almost 30,000 of them. This is a perfectly good working laptop. He was going to sell them to computer refurbishers for 25 cents each, so people who bought a used laptop with their legal Microsoft license like this one could fix their operating system if it crashed instead of just chucking away the computer. I want this to get reused by people who need the repair tools. I want them to get to them so that they can repair their electronics so I don't have to see them in landfills. But uh, apparently, apparently the government thinks these are worth something. 
The government initially valued them at $8.3 million, which is why, before he had even sold a single disc, he got word his house was being raided by federal authorities. And that was the first time I knew that there was any problem when uh, armed, you know, guys with guns and masks stormed my house. Federal prosecutors accused him of criminal copyright infringement, and Microsoft experts testified the discs were worth $25 a piece. The judge agreed and sentenced Lundgren to the minimum sentence, a fine and 15 months in prison. Lundgren says it's a victory for big companies who do all they can to persuade consumers to use gadgets for a year or two and then toss them away. Refurbishers are going to start not refurbishing these low-end products. And if they don't, those are going to go into landfills. Where's the light switch? So in a few days, he'll head to a federal prison in Oregon. Ever hey, the recycler, he finds a How's certain beauty and function even in this. Now I've become an e-waste martyr. The beautiful thing about that is it's going to bring awareness to the thing that I've been fighting for my entire life. But I need, I need the world to stand up and, and say, no, that's not right. This is our product. We own this product, and we have the right to do with it as we choose. As for the thousands of restore discs he bought for five cents each, Lundgren says he plans to send them to the judge. Because they are physically worthless. A message to the man who sent him to prison, he says, for basically nothing. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Chatsworth, California. Now, as you just heard, Microsoft sure doesn't think it's for nothing. We asked them for an interview. They declined, but they did point us to a lengthy blog post on their website. In it, Microsoft seems to suggest it's not the real villain here. It didn't bring the case against Lundgren at all. That was U.S. Customs. It goes on to address what it thinks is the heart of the matter, saying, we remain committed to protecting our customers when we see others working to deceive them, especially when they're acting unlawfully. And it stands by the claim that Mr. Lundgren set up a large counterfeit operation in China and intended to profit from his actions. A very different view from the one Lundgren holds. Well, the moment is up next on The National. But first, a reminder to subscribe to our newsletter. The National Today takes you insider journalism every afternoon and features stories you may have missed. Today, it was a low-tech crime spree in Newfoundland involving thieves, sledgehammers, and parking meters. Subscribe to our newsletter at cbcnews.ca slash the national. Here we go. Just remember the greatest gift is to dance. Just remember your greatest gift is to dance. Tonight on The National, some developing news are tracking south of the border. The Washington Post and The Globe and Mail are reporting that President Trump plans to impose sweeping tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum imports. According to The Post, the taxes could take effect as soon as this Friday. That's when the exemptions Trump had granted to Canada, Mexico and the EU are due to expire. But worth a note, sources also tell both The Globe and The Post that Trump could change his mind. We are watching for details tonight out of a high-profile meeting in New York. That was U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arriving today ahead of a dinner with one of North Korea's top officials, Kim Yong-chol. The pair is expected to discuss plans for that on-again, off-again summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Canada's Justice Minister has ordered an independent external review into the extradition of Hassan Dia. Canada sent the now 64-year-old to France in 2014 after authorities there accused him of being involved in the 1980 bombing of a Paris synagogue. Diab denied the accusations, and the charges were eventually dropped. But he spent three years in a French prison while being investigated, and his supporters say he should never have been extradited there in the first place. In Ottawa today, Diab said a simple review doesn't go far enough. He wants a full public inquiry. Only an independent and public inquiry would answer our questions and concerns and pave the way for a fundamental or for fundamental changes in the extradition law. The external review of Diab's case hasn't started yet, but in addition to that, the Justice Department is conducting an internal lessons learned examination. 
And after, after promising for months to release a fully costed platform, Ontario's PC party has published a list of campaign promises on its website and included on the list how much each commitment would cost. But not there is how exactly the PCs would pay for them if Doug Ford is elected Premier. The provincial election is set for next Thursday, June 7th. Sometimes all you need is a little help from a stranger. Alison Hill knows that. She is from Halifax, really wanted to deliver a birthday surprise to her mom, but her mother lives 4,000 kilometers away. So Hill asked for help on an online forum. And what happened next is our moment of the day. No, I didn't even expect it. I really didn't think it was going to work. I told him my mother's address. He went to the flower shop in Dauphin and picked up the flowers that I had paid for. He asked me for my mother's name, which I never told him because it didn't occur to me to tell him that. And then this truck drove by and stopped and honked. And I went and to see what he wanted. And he asked me if I was Tia. And I asked him his name and he said his name was Dean. And I gave him a big hug and a kiss and thanked him again and again and again because I'm so thrilled. I didn't think it would happen. I really didn't think it would work. I don't know how I'm going to top it next year. Okay, so if, if you saw that picture there, uh, Tia, who just turned 71, happy birthday, <laughs> is holding not just the flowers but a cake because apparently Dean didn't just pick up the flowers. He went and either made or bought a cake and wrote her name on it and delivered that too, which was not part of what Alison Hill asked for. <laughs> right. And the mystery just keeps going on because they've, they've tried to track Dean down. They haven't been able to figure out anything about him beyond his, his name is Dean. And they even went to the florist to try to track him down to see if they know anything about him. They didn't have a clue. So, so my theory about all of this is that it was all just a dream. Never happened. <laughs> <laughs> These moments of generosity rely on the kindness of strangers and also trust in strangers. Our producer, Ariel, gave Allison a call. Were you concerned at all about the stranger delivering a cake to your mom? <laughs> And the daughter said, nope. <laughs> that is the National for May the 30th. Good night. Good night. Good night.